Odin established the same law in his land that had been in force in Asa land. On winter day there should be a blood sacrifice for a good year, and in the middle of winter for a good crop, and the third blood sacrifice should be on summer day, a victory sacrifice. Seasonal Salutations This time last year I created a video addressing the common misconception that the Germanic holiday called Yule took place on the winter solstice. One of the excellent contributors of our third academy has recently been compiling an article about Yule and the associated sacrifices like Sonoblot and Thoroblot, including when it is supposed to take place. This article is not finished, but I thought it appropriate to share some of it with you. Yule was celebrated for three nights starting on the full moon following the new moon after the winter solstice. This is evident from the above mentioned quote coupled with how the pre-Christian calendar worked, the runic calendars, and a passage from the saga of Harkon the Good. It is evident from this quote that Yule lasted three days, the first being on the full moon itself, and that it certainly wasn't celebrated on the winter solstice, because at that time Christmas was celebrated on the winter solstice, which in the Julian calendar appears on December 25th. There would be no need to move it if these two celebrations coincided, However, there's also this passage from Bede's De Temporum Rationale. The months of Yule derive their name from the day when the sun turns back and begins to increase, because one of these months precedes this day and the other follows. This could be explained as a mistake on Bede's part, since he could have conflated the term for midwinter and winter solstice. It has also been suggested that Bede outright lies in this case, in order to show the future generations that the Anglo-Saxons always celebrated the birth of Jesus and Pascha. It could also be that the Anglo-Saxon peoples indeed moved their Yule celebration onto the winter solstice under the influence of the Romano-Britons or Christianity, but Yule celebration on the winter solstice remains an anomaly. In Scandinavia, there seems to exist a remnant of this concept of a Yule moon. The term is attested in Old Norse as Jola Tungel, and in various derivatives in later Scandinavian folklore, Swedish Jultungel, Norwegian Jultangel, and Juleman, Danish Julemai, and Finnish Joluku, all refer to the full moon around the time of the Epiphany on January the 6th in the Gregorian calendar, which is a few days later in the Julian calendar. As Andreas Nordberg says, this association with the Epiphany appears to be a Christian approximation from an older, pre-Christian calendrical system described above. The relationship of Thoroblot and Yule also ought to be discussed. Thoroblot is attested in Versu Noregur Bigdist in the Flateyarbok. To him, Thori, the Kven sacrificed that it might be snowy, and that there might be good going on snowshoon. That is their harvest. That sacrifice was to be at midwinter, and the month Thori is named after it. This is in accord with what we know of Yule, so it is reasonable to assume that these might be the same celebration. One historical Yule practice was something called Heitsdrenging. A boar would be led into the hall, and the people would lay their hands on it and make solemn vows for the year ahead. For example, in the saga of the Jomsvikings, Swain Fortbeard's followers vow to ravage Norway and kill Jarl Harkon. Afterwards, the boar was sacrificed and eaten at Sonarblot. It's possible that this was connected to the worship of Ingvi Freyr, hence the boar. Or this could have been in honour of Sehrimnir, the boar that feeds the Einherjar in Valhall. We don't know when Sonarblot was, but on one day this winter, this could be observed with a ceremonial feast and an offering to Ingvi Freyr, and by making vows for the year ahead. In the Herverar saga Og Heidrex, it states, And they would sacrifice a boar in the Sonarblot, on Yule Eve, the sonar boar was led into the hall before the king, then people laid their hands on its bristles and made vows. This could be interpreted as an instance of oath-swearing on Yule. A 6th century Byzantine chronicler Procopius, in his book History of the Wars, mentions a land in the far north that he calls Thule. It is very possible he means Scandinavia, and thus a land where Yule would have been celebrated at that time. He names the tribe of Goths among the many others that inhabit this land, and he gives us a second-hand account of a festival that occurs there in winter. He says, The sun at the time of the summer solstice never sets for forty days, but appears constantly during this whole time above the earth. 
But not less than six months later, at about the time of the winter solstice, the sun is never seen on this island for 40 days. They said that the sun during those 40 days does not indeed set just as has been stated, but is visible to the people there at one time towards the east and again towards the west. Whenever, therefore, on its return, it reaches the same place on the horizon where they had previously been accustomed to see it rise, they reckon in this way that one day and one night have passed. When, however, the time of the nights arrives, they always take note of the courses of the moon and stars and thus reckon the measure of days. And when a time amounting to 35 days has passed in this long night, certain men are sent to the summits of the mountains, for this is the custom among them, and when they are able from that point barely to see the sun, they bring back word to the people below that within five days the sun will shine upon them. And the whole population celebrates a festival at the good news, and that too in the darkness. And this is the greatest festival which the natives of Thule have. It is certainly possible that what he recorded is either some northern variation or an older version of Yule, and thus should be included here. It should be noted that the method of dating this festivity doesn't seem to be on the full moon after the winter solstice, but it doesn't appear on the solstice either. But we've yet to explain an occurrence of a 12 day long Yuletide celebration held by the Varangians in Byzantium as recorded by Emperor Constantine Porphyrogentius in his book De Ceremonis Aulae Byzantinae. On the 9th of the 12 Yule days, the men waited at both entrances to the Great Hall of the Emperor, ready to perform the Gothic play. At the left door is the naval admiral with some men and flute players from his ships. Behind him stand two Goths, dressed in fur coats, the hair side turned out. They wear masks. The commander of the bodyguard is waiting at the right entrance with a detachment of his men. As soon as the Emperor appears, he orders the Master of Ceremonies to lead the dancers in, and they then rush into the hall, while they strike the shields they carry with their spears, making a great noise, and they keep shouting, Yule, Yule, until they have reached the Holy Table. There, the two units approach from both sides at the same time and form a large double circle. After walking around the holy table three times in this manner, both units retreat to their seats, the naval warriors on the right and the land warriors on the left, and those of the two units called the Goths read the so-called Gothic Song. This was followed by a long song in honour of the Emperor. Well, that's it for the completed parts. I, for one, am definitely interested in seeing this article finished. Thanks for watching, and have a merry day of Sol Invictus. Send him to the sprouting chamber!